Thanks, <coughs> Brother Joey. <coughs> Good morning, uh, brothers and sisters and uh, young people. We come now to have a look at what I believe is a delightful uh, section of the Scriptures because it's a parable. It sets out the entire purpose of God in a series of chapters from Genesis 21 to 26. And if you haven't seen this before, then you'll probably never read the section of Scripture again the same way because it's just wonderful what is laid out here for us. So, brothers and sisters, we're going to start with that, with that divine allegory because this is the, the key. This is God telling us how we should interpret what we read here in this section of Scripture. And as we saw, I think, yesterday, in this allegory, uh, we have the setting forth of his purpose. Under the law of Moses, you've got, of course, Jews, natural Jews, living under law, circumcised in flesh. They're represented by Ishmael. And Hagar, of course, his mother, a bondwoman, represents the Mosaic Covenant, the law of Moses. Now, I want you to come back to Genesis chapter 16 very briefly with me. Can't afford to do much more than just point you in the right direction here. But that will be sufficient. Because when, when the angel came to Hagar, when she fled from Sarah, remember, certain things were said which are vital to this allegory. So we come to verse um, 11 of Genesis 16. And the angel of Yahweh said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and thou shalt bear a son, and shalt call his name Ishmael. Now, Ishmael means, Ail will hear. You might have remembered the words we've just read in Genesis 21, that God heard the voice of the lad. Remember that? Twice that's stated in Genesis 21. He heard the voice of the lad. But it wasn't the lad who cried. It was Hagar who cried. In Genesis 21. But God heard the voice of the lad. Yes. It's all part of this allegory as we're going to see. Read on. Verse, verse 12. And he will be a wild man. Now there's a word missing here. If you go to the Hebrew text. The word kamor is not translated by the translators here. Kamor is the word for the male ass. The symbol of Israel brothers and sisters. And this should read as many a really uh, straightforward translations, the, the more literal translations say it should read, he will be a wild ass of an Adam. In other words, we've got the symbol for the nation of Israel used here. The male ass, the kamor. So Ishmael is going to set forth natural Israel. This is all part of this wonderful allegory. And then it says this about him in verse 12. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. You know what the Apostle Paul says? Jot down 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 and 15. I haven't got time to take you there. You know what he says? He says the Jews killed their own Messiah, Christ. They killed Christ, and they're against every man. That's what he said. They're against every man. That was the fulfilment. Of the allegory in Genesis 16 verse 12. His hand shall be against every man. Look it up for yourself. And then it says this. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Well, so what? I dwell in the presence of all my brethren. What does that mean? Well, in the allegory, you see, what it means is exactly what Christ said in Matthew 23 verse 5. When he's talking about Jews living under law, you know what he says about them? All their works they do for to be seen of men. They come to the presence of their brethren to be seen of men. You can say, oh, what a marvellous keeper of law he is, see? Everything was done for public consumption. They dwelt in the presence of all their brethren. So guess what it says in Genesis 25 about Ishmael, how he died. It says he died in the presence of all his brethren, because that's where Judaism ends up. So you see the allegory? Now, that's all I can say about that, because there's a lot more you could say, but that's enough to get us moving in Genesis chapter 21. Because when you come to Genesis 21, you've got these two parts of the allegory there. You see, when you come to verse 6, Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh. So she names her boy Laughter, Isaac. So all that here will laugh with me. Now, here's another little passage you can jot down. Alongside of verse 6 of Genesis chapter 21. Jot down Isaiah 66, it's the last chapter of Isaiah, verses 7 to 13. The language of that section of Isaiah 66, 7 to 13, is lifted from Genesis 21. And it's in the context of Zion having children. 
You and me, brothers and sisters. And it says something ridiculous in Isaiah 66. You know what it says? That Zion's children are born before she goes into labour. How does that happen? How can you produce children before Zion goes into labour? Well, you see, Zion has produced children before the time of Jacob's trouble has come upon Zion and its people. Yeah, before the events of Armageddon, the time of Jacob's trouble, Zion has already produced children, and you and I are the evidence of it. Born before the time of Jacob's trouble. We will be glorified, brothers and sisters, at Sinai about nine years before Zion goes through her travail. That's marvellous, isn't it? It's all drawn from here. All that would rejoice with me. That's the language picked up in Isaiah 66. Look at verse 7 of Genesis 21. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah would have given children such? Children? That's plural. I thought she just had one son. No, no, no. This one son was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And through him the promises are going to be fulfilled. Sarah is going to have a multitudinous seed. That's why she says, see, this is her vision, this is her faith. This is not just one boy. This boy represents Christ. And through him the promises are going to come. And there's going to be a multitude of children. Yeah. For I've given him him a son in his old age, he says. Then look at verse 8. And the child grew. That's the first time you read those words in the Bible about a child. And the child grew. You know where the last time is? Luke chapter 2 verse 40. Our Lord Jesus Christ and the child grew and increased in favour with God and man. Yeah, first and last occurrence. Is that, is that accidental, you think? Of course not. This is a wonderful allegory, brothers and sisters. And what we have here, beginning in Genesis 21, goes on like that, chapter after chapter, setting out the whole divine program in which you and I are personally involved. So let's, let's do our best to follow it through. Because the next thing we read is that Ishmael and Hagar are rejected from Abraham's house. And he doesn't like this at all. He's very upset about this. You know what God says to him in verse 10? When, when Sarah saw um, Ishmael um, questioning Isaac's origins, because he was actually saying that Isaac was really the, the son of Abimelech. That's what he was saying that he was born of fornication. How do we know that's true? Because that's exactly what the Jews said about Christ in John chapter 8, when they said to him, we be not born of fornication. They were questioning his origins, weren't they? Yeah, there is the forerunner of that. So Ishmael and Hagar have to be banished from Abraham's house. He's very upset about that. But look at verse 10. (laughs) Wherefore she said... And to Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in, the, in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abraham, let it not be grievous. You do exactly what Sarah says. Now, it's very rare, isn't it, that God overrules the husband to say that the wife has got it right. It's rare. You know Why? Because Paul tells us why in Galatians 4 and verse 30. You know what what Paul says? He actually quotes verse 10 of Genesis 21. He says, did you hear what the scripture said? He doesn't say, did you hear what Sarah said? He says, did you hear what the scripture said? In other words, Sarah had spoken the word of God. And brethren, there are times, if you don't get it right, if your wife is actually speaking the word of God, yeah, you can be overruled. All right? And Abraham was overruled because his wife got it right. She was voicing the scripture. He wasn't. Now, why? Why was, why was she right? Well, of course, because of the allegory. Ishmael represents Jews living under law. They were to be evicted from Abraham's house and Abraham's land. And that happened in AD 70, didn't it? Through AD 70 to 135, the Jews were evicted from Abraham's land. They were cast out of his house. And what what happened to them? They were going to wander aimlessly through the wilderness, weren't they? And they couldn't find a well. That well just happened to be called Beersheba. You see what it says if you come down to 
into verse 14 at the end of the verse that when Hagar and Ishmael are out in this wilderness and the bottle of water runs out, there's actually a well there, verse 14. They wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And a little later on, they're shown that well. They're shown the well. And they can't find... They're going around and around in circles. They can't find the well, just like the Jews in dispersion today. They don't understand the things you and I understand, do they? They can't find the well of Beersheba, the well of the seven, the well of the covenant. No. So you see, the allegory is perfect, isn't it? It's perfect. Now, we read in verse 16 that, by the way, it says the child here. That word child in verse 16 is actually the word yeled. It's the same word that is used in verse 15. She cast the child. almost sounds like she's got a baby and sort of throws it under a bush. He's actually 18 years of age. He could cast his mother under a bush if he wanted to. He's 18. But you see, there's no water. And they're going to die in this wilderness. At the end of verse 16, she sat over against him to watch his death and lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. Now, why doesn't it say he heard the voice of Hagar? Because she represents the law. Mm. He heard the voice of the lad because he represents the Jews in dispersion. And God has heard their voice, hasn't he? And by angelic intervention, brothers and sisters, by angelic intervention, Israel has been preserved through centuries of dispersion when the nations have tried to destroy them. Yeah, so it's all there. It's all there in this parable. And of course, we know what happens. He becomes very self-sufficient in verse 20. God was with the lad, as he has been with Israel through their history. And he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. What that means is that he set the pattern for Esau. And Esau, of course, was the man who was very self-dependent, self, uh, um, is that the way I want? Self-reliant, I mean. Okay? And this is, this is the pattern that was set, self-reliance. That's the Jews, isn't it? They don't see where their help's coming from. No. They're very self-reliant. And so we have this wonderful parable unfolding. What comes next? Oh, marvellously. In verse 22 of Genesis 21, we have willing Gentiles converted to the truth. So when, when these two men, Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, came to Abraham, they weren't coming because they wanted to set up some kind of business in the Negev. You know, this wasn't some kind of proposal to set up an ice cream parlour in the barren wilderness of the Negev. Abraham didn't do business deals. You know, Christadelphians don't do business deals with the world, do you? No. This was about the truth. There had been some issues. They're sorted out. This is about the truth. And when Abraham makes a covenant, he makes a covenant on the basis of the truth. Abimelech and Phicol, his chief captain, are coming into the truth, brothers and sisters. This is about the conversion of the Gentiles. Verses 22 through 34. Now you might say, well, how do you know that's true? Come on, you make statements, prove them to me. Yeah, I don't make statements I can't prove. I want to show you exactly what this means. I want you to read with me what happens here in verse 22. And it came to pass at that time, what time? Well, verse 14, the time when, when Hagar and Ishmael are evicted, they're evicted from Abraham's house. So when the Jews were evicted from the land in AD 70, what was happening at that time? Well, the gospel is going to the Gentiles, isn't it? Yes. So it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain, now Phicol has a very interesting name. His name means the mouth of all. In other words, when he speaks, he speaks for everyone. He's the mouth of all. Now, have you ever wondered why his name appears twice in this chapter? I mean, do you care that when Abimelech came that he had men with him? I mean, kings don't travel by themselves, do they? Of course he's got men with him. He's got soldiers to protect him. So, why does God tell us that Phicol is there? Are you interested in that? It's put in for a, a deliberate purpose, brothers and sisters and young people. I want to see that purpose in a moment. But let's read on. Verse 22. So you've got Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, spake unto Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. 
Now therefore, <coughs> swear unto me here by God, that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son. I want you to notice the language. Just lock this away in your brain box. That thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son. Three generations. But according to the kindness, and that's the word K said, that's the divine characteristic of loving kindness, that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me, and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. And Abraham said, I will seven myself. That word swear there at the end of verse 24 is Shabbat. I will seven myself. In other words, I'll make a covenant. So what does he do? He brings out seven ewe lambs to make a covenant with Abimelech. Got a picture? I want you to come to Isaiah chapter 59. In Isaiah 59, and we read, we're going to pick it up from verse 20. It'll be pretty, pretty obvious what the context is. And you just read the preceding verses, you'll get a bit of a feel for context. Verse 20 of Isaiah 59 says this. Now it's clearly about the time of the establishment of the kingdom. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith Yahweh. So what's the Abrahamic promise about? What's the blessing of Abraham, brothers and sisters? <coughs> Carry nothing else away from this weekend. What's the blessing of Abraham? Turning everyone away from their iniquities. Acts 3, 26. Okay? Exactly what that says in verse 20 isn't it? Then read verse 21. As for me, anybody got a memory as to where that phrase comes from? That's Genesis 17. As for me, says God, Genesis 17 verse 4. And then goes on in the as for chapter. As for Abraham, as for the, un for the uncircumcised, as for Sarai, as for Ishmael. It's the as for chapter. Straight from Genesis 17. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith Yahweh. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, notice the language, thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith Yahweh, from henceforth and for the ad olam, for the millennium. Okay? that leads to eternity. You know where that's coming from? It's coming from Genesis 21, verse 23. The three generations. And isn't it interesting, he says, thy mouth, the mouth of thy seed, and the mouth of thy seed seed. In other words, it's the mouth of all. Yeah, Phycol. That's what his name means. The mouth of all. Isaiah 59, 21 is quoting Genesis 21 and verse 23. And it's telling you something, isn't it? It's telling you this is not some ordinary business deal. This is about conversion. This is about conversion of Gentiles. Yeah. Now why would that happen, brothers and sisters, before Genesis 22? Why would it happen? Well, because you see, the work of Christ involved both Jew and Gentile. He didn't just come to save Jews. He started with them. By the time he went to the cross, Mark 11 shows us clearly he was involving Gentiles because his own people had rejected him. That's what that's about. It has to come before Genesis 22 and the chapter that deals with the, the wonderful work of God in Christ. And you see, it's a significant fact that Beersheba is, is named in Genesis 21. If you come back to Genesis 21, verse 33, Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and he called there on the name of Yahweh the everlasting God or the God of the Olam, the God of the millennial age. Okay? They named this world Beersheba because of the seven ewe lambs that are offered to make the covenant with Gentiles. And it's from Beersheba, brothers and sisters, that Abraham takes Isaac to go up to the land of Moriah to sacrifice him unto Yahweh. And guess where they return to? Guess where they return to? We'll come to Genesis 22, verse 19. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to where? Beersheba. 
And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba, the well of the seven. You see, we're being told something. This well which memorialises the conversion of Gentiles by sacrifice is the place where it all begins. In the type, when Abraham takes his only beloved son and goes up to Moriah to offer him up after the pattern, of course, that Yahweh himself would follow in due course in a much superior way. That's why it's so important. Where are we up to? (coughs) Genesis 22. Okay, let's move into Genesis 22. What do you read in Genesis 22? I'm not going to say much about this chapter because it's the subject for the exhortation, so you're going to have to wait for that one. But let's just just see what it really is saying to us. Verse 3 of Genesis 22. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and he saddled his ass. There it is. That's the Kamor, the male ass. That's the symbol for Israel in the word of God. He, he saddled his ass and he took two of his young men. Two? Why two? Well, Jew and Gentile related to Israel by the promises that God made to Abraham. Yeah, he's going up to sacrifice his son like Yahweh would sacrifice his son to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And Isaac was dead for three days, wasn't he? From the time that Abraham left Beersheba to the time he got to Moriah was three days. Isaac was dead for three days because Abraham was determined to kill him. He didn't get up late. Did you notice what it says? That he rose early in verse 3. He rose up early. It took him three days to get there. He didn't sort of delay and dilly-dally and say, I don't really want to sacrifice my son. He couldn't wait to get there to sacrifice his son because he knew he would come back with him. A resurrected man. Isaac was dead for three days. And we know, of course, we know that Paul tells us in Hebrews 11 verse 19 that when Isaac got off that altar, it was like a resurrection from the dead. He received him in a figure, it says in Hebrews 11 verse 19, as though he'd been raised from the dead. Because he had been dead, effectively, for three days. Yeah, we can see what Genesis 22 is about. It's all about the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. So how does, it, how does this chapter end, Genesis 22? More later on, of course, on just beautiful chapter. But how does it end? Well, it ends with verses 20 to 24. You ever wondered why that's there on the end of Genesis 22? Well, what does it tell us? That section tells us that Abraham, after he's made this sacrifice and returns to Beersheba, because it says, after, and it came to pass after these things, that it was told Abraham, saying... Your, your, uh, your relation uh, in Haran has had some children. Behold, Milcah, she hath also born unto thy brother Nahor, and there are listed his sons. You ever counted them? There are twelve. Twelve's the number of Israel, brothers and sisters. This is the family of God. This is the Israel of God outside the land. They represent you and me. So when the sacrifice of Christ had been performed, and he was raised from the dead, what happened next? Out go the apostles into all lands to find the Israel of God in foreign lands. Yeah, that's why he hears about the twelve sons of Nahor up in Haran. Let me come to to Genesis 23. I want you to notice something particular about this chapter. And I'm going to lead you into it by asking you to look at verse 19 of Genesis 22. I'm going to ask you this question. I want you to think about it while I'm talking. In Genesis 22 verse 19 it says this, So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba. Who's missing from that verse? Think about that. Who's missing, do you think, from Genesis 23? The same man. Isaac. You don't read about Isaac in Genesis 23. And this is the chapter that deals with the burial of Sarah, his mother, for whom he mourned for three years thereafter. Did you know that? We'll find that out from Genesis 24. He mourned deeply for his mother for three years after her death. Now, he was definitely at her funeral. No question about that. He would have played a vital role in her funeral. Not one 
word about Isaac in Genesis 23? Why not? Well, let me ask you this question. After Christ had been raised from the dead, where did he go? Well, he went to heaven, didn't he? After six weeks, he went to heaven to be with his father. He wasn't there, brothers and sisters, when Zion fell asleep in AD 70. So here you've got Sarah being buried in the cave of Machpelah, the first to be buried in that cave. And it says in verse 2, and this, I put this up because I've heard some silly nonsense about this particular verse, so I want to correct that. Verse 2 says, And Sarah died in Kerjath Arba, the same as Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. And some say, well, there you are, they were separated. Abraham and Sarah were separated when she died. He had to come from afar when she died. How ridiculous is that? I mean, it's just nonsense, isn't it? People should look at some decent translations. If you've got any doubt of it, look at the translate, decent translations. And you look at a decent translation like the RSV that says Abraham went in. And that's supported by Rotherham and the literal um, Greens interlinear Bible. In other words, he went into her tent. They had separate tents. So he, got, he, he heard the news. He woke up one morning. Sarah has died overnight, perhaps. Someone tells him, so he goes out of his tent and into her tent and finds his wife dead. And he goes to the men of the place and says, sell me the cave of Machpelah. It might bury my dead out of my sight. And they, they, they sell it to him. They have to sell it to him, brothers and sisters, because he's not going to take possession of this land by grant or gift until he is raised from the dead. That's why he buys it. He says, no, no, I am not taking it from you by a gift under no circumstances I'm waiting until it's given to me as a gift from God at the time of my glorification now Sarah is a type of Zion isn't she? we saw that yesterday in AD 70 Zion fell asleep as it were and she was hidden away like Sarah is buried in the cave of Machpelah the things that belonged to Zion went into you know, dormancy for a while didn't they and they're still dormant. But she has to be brought back. I want you to notice this passage in Isaiah 52 verse 8. It's, the language is, is redolent of this particular type. And it says this in Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 8. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye. When Yahweh shall bring again Zion. Yes. So for the time being, she's sort of asleep. She's pushed aside. She's hidden away. But Yahweh is going to bring again Zion. So it's in this period when Sarah has died and she's hidden away in the cave at Machpelah that represents that long period of history from AD 70 down to our time, brothers and sisters. Where's Christ when that's happening? Well, he's in heaven, isn't he? That's why Isaac's not mentioned in Genesis chapter 23. He's just not there, though he's clearly, obviously there, involved in all of these funeral arrangements. Got a picture? Isn't it marvellous that even what the scripture leaves out is important? So when you read your Bible, you need to read it very carefully and say, well, why does it say that? But also you need to ask, why doesn't it say what you would put in there? I know what I would have put in there. So why doesn't it say that? Because God has a purpose. It's a parable. And the parable continues in Genesis 24. In Genesis 24, we have Abraham seeking a wife for his son Isaac. Where does he seek that wife? Well, in Gentile lands. He sends his servants, probably Eliezer, he sends his servants to go up to Haran to find a wife for Isaac. In other words, it's exactly the same process that God used after the ascension of Christ. God set out to seek a bride for his son in Gentile lands. And he's still doing that, isn't he? Still calling. Which is why, brothers and sisters, something happens in Genesis 24 that you and I probably think is unnecessary. I'm going to point that out in a minute. But look at verse 2 of Genesis 24. Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, and was more than likely Eliezer, because we're told that in chapter 15, verse 2, 
Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. Now that's rather, that's rather sensitive. By thigh he means on the innermost side of the thigh, near the crotch. <laughs> What's that about? Well, we see, that's where the generative organs are. And what Abraham is saying, what I'm asking you to do has got to do with the continuance of the promises. I've got to find a bride for my son Isaac so that the promises can continue through him. Okay, that's what he's saying. It's all about the generation of a family. That's why the hand goes under the thigh, brothers and sisters. (coughs) Now this story, the story of what the servant has been asked to do and what happens to him when he arrives in Haran. We know the story well, don't we? I'm not going to go through all the details of it. You know it very well. But one thing you will have noticed if you've read Genesis 24 carefully is the repetition that occurs. Eliezer, if it is him, keeps on retelling the story. He tells it to Rebecca. He tells it to the household. And then when he wants to go, he tells the story again. It's told over. And why, why do you want to waste all these words for? Why am I hearing the same story all over again? Well, because this is about the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles. It began in the first century with the Acts of the Apostles. It began with the work of the Apostles. But it's still going on today. The same story, the same gospel message is still being taught today, isn't it? It's just being repeated over and over and over again. Yes, that's why it's repeated so often in Genesis 24. It's a parable about the work of God amongst the Gentiles. But there's something even more important in this chapter. I want you to come with me to these three verses you can see there on that final dot point on the screen. Verse 15 of Genesis 24. Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, meets a remarkable woman. Her name is Rebecca. She's got something that is unique. She is a very beautiful girl, but she's also a very spiritual girl. They don't always go hand in hand. She's got everything, this girl. Why would that be the case, do you think? Well, because she's the type of the bride of Christ. That's why. There's a great beauty about this girl. So, verse 15. And came to pass, before he had done speaking, that, behold, Rebekah came out. And, of course, we're told about her beauty in verse 16. The damsel was very fair to look upon. It actually means very fair of form. A virgin which means that she was pure and chaste. And to emphasise that, it then says, neither had any man known her. Now, she's a virgin. That's obvious, isn't it? Isn't that obvious? So why would you put that in there? It's quite superfluous. If she's a virgin, then no man has known her. So why? Because God's telling you something about his ecclesia. When Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 11... To the Corinthians who were defiling the faith by allowing Judaizers to corrupt their minds, he said, I'm worried about you because I have presented you as a chaste virgin unto Christ and you are being deceived by the serpent. That's why. It's an emphasis, brothers and sisters, that the bride of Christ has got to be pure, got to be chaste. And men... Men had pursued Rebecca because she was a beautiful girl and she had resisted them like the bride of Christ does. She's not going to be corrupted by the people of this world. That was her approach. She's a wonderful girl. And when she arrives on the scene, you know, she, she goes up and down that staircase to the, to the well dozens of times. She's got ten camels and they drink gallons at a time. She's going up and down. And this man's saying, good grief, what have I struck here? And when she arrived, she didn't see him looking around. She saw him in the act of prayer. See what it says in verse 15? It came to pass before he had done speaking. He was praying to God. She saw him in the act of prayer. Look at verse 26. When he's told her certain things... And she told him certain things. It says in verse 26 that the man bowed down his head and worshipped Yahweh. Now, get a picture in your mind. He's got Rebecca standing right in front of him. There's a discussion going on and all of a sudden he bows his head. And he's worshipping Yahweh. And she's looking at him. Wow. 
Never seen that before. And look what happens in verse 52, brothers and sisters. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped Yahweh. He's in the house now. He's got, he's got uh, Rebecca's family there. Bethuel and Laban and all the others. And it says, came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped Yahweh, bowing himself to the ground. He's down on the earth. He's on his, on his knees and hands. Praying and worshipping to God. And they look at him saying, Oh, never seen a Christian girlfriend like that before. Now, is he putting this on? Of course he's not. It's genuine. He's so moved by the hand of God in this, this affair. He can't help himself. He's down on his conscience praising God. And she's looking at him. And then comes the test, brothers and sisters, because they say, the family's pretty confident. This is what they say in verse 55. Her brother and her mother said, let the damsel abide with us a few days. It means ten months or maybe a year. It's a long time. And he said to them, look, don't hinder me, verse 56, seeing Yahweh's clearly prospered my journey. Don't hinder me. And they said, okay. Yeah, you just see the smirk on their face. We'll ask the girl. She's not going to go and marry someone in Australia. <laughs> She won't go to Australia. <laughs> and she says, I will go. I've got an unmarried son, 30 years of age. Any take us here? Come to Australia. Why would she want to go? Ever thought about that? Why would a girl who's known nothing else but Haran this man's turned up a day before and he says, I want to go right now to take you back away from your home. You'll never see your family again. And she doesn't. And she says, I will go. Why would you do that? Well, one, she's believed the words that he's spoken about the promises and we know that from verse 60 because her family says, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions. That's sort of reference to the Abrahamic promises. And let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. That's Genesis 22 verse 17, isn't it? So clearly she's believed the promises, but there's something even more powerful than that. You know what it was? Example. Because in Rebecca's mind, when she watched this man, probably Eliezer, respond and react to the hand of God in his search for a bride for Isaac, when she saw his response, him down on his knees worshipping, in her mind she said, if Isaac, the man that they want me to marry, is anything like that man, then I want to marry him. So the Apostle Paul could say in Galatians 3 verse 1, O oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. You look at me, says Paul, you see Christ. Be ye followers of me, he said, even as I also of Christ. So when people saw Paul, what did they say? Well, if Christ, his master, is anything like Paul, I want to be part of his bride. That's what they said. And the Apostle Peter chimes in in 1 Peter 1 verse 8. You know what he says? He says about Jesus Christ, whom having not seen... I haven't seen him. Have you seen him? Have you seen Christ? I haven't seen him. Whom having not seen, ye love. Hmm. And how do you come to love Christ when you have, whom you haven't seen? Well, there's two ways. Through the word, first and foremost. But by seeing Christ in those around you. That's how you see him. <coughs> Because he could save himself, couldn't he? To the stupid question, show us the Father. He said, how long have I been with you and you haven't seen the Father? He that's seen me has seen the Father. Haven't you got that yet? See, brothers and sisters, it's a very, very powerful parable, isn't it? I will go. Psalm 45, verses 10 to 11. 
Psalm 45, 10 to 11. A psalm written about the marriage of Christ to his bride. Don't need to say very much about it, do we? Because it's obviously about the marriage of Christ to his bride. But look what it says about his bride in verses 10 and 11. Hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thine ear. Forget also thine own people and thy father's house. It's exactly what Rebecca did. She forgot her own people, her natural family. Verse 11. What's the response of the bridegroom to that, brothers and sisters? So shall the king (coughs) greatly desire thy beauty. For he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. There's the principle that applies to Rebecca. Here in Genesis chapter 24. We mentioned the thousands of millions, let's just push on. Come back to Genesis 24 verse 63. Because when she's brought back, we read in verse 62 that Isaac came from the way of the well Lahai Roi, which means the well of the living one, my beholder. And you know who named that? Hagar. Because she was shocked. She was shocked to think that an angel was there that was looking at her. Oh, amazing. Amazing discovery, isn't it? Yeah. There was an angel with us all the time. We're in the presence of our God, brothers. And Isaac knew that. And you know why? He went to the well, Lahai Rai, because he wanted to be in the presence of his God. Men love darkness, said Christ, but they that come to the light come because they want to be exposed before their God. He wanted to be in the presence. What was he doing out here? Verse 63. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field. Now, in the margin of your Bible, you might have to pray. Wrong. The word meditate in the Hebrew, suach, means to muse pensively, usually with sorrow. And we know it was sorrow, because we read in verse 67 that when he took Rebekah into Sarah, his mother's tent, he was comforted, it says, after his mother's death. So we know what it was. He was going, this is three years after Sarah's death, he was going out to the well Lahai Roa to be in the presence of God to mourn the death of his mother. What do you think Christ has been doing for the last 2,000 years? In the presence of his God, of his Father. Mourning for Zion. That's what he's been doing. Mourning for Zion. And he's about to be comforted. Do you know what he's going to do, brothers and sisters? He's going to take you and me as part of the bride of Christ into Sarah's tent. Who's Sarah represent? Well, Zion. Yeah. He's going to take us, brothers and sisters, and be comforted in Zion. That's what's happening here. And we see the respect of the bride too, don't we? When she sees Isaac, she says, who's that? I have seen him before. Who's that? That's your coming husband. So she immediately takes out a veil and covers her own glory. Mm. And she gets down from the camel in a mark of respect. It's the spirit of the bride. That's all I can say about God. This is 1 to 6. Keturah's sons create ecclesias outside the land. This is where Job came from. So when Abraham sent Keturah's sons, he wasn't evicting them because they were not faithful he wanted to give everything to Isaac he didn't want them mixed, you know, getting mixed up with this he said look why don't you go and establish ecclesias across the Jordan so they went to the east country this is where Job came from yeah, from Abraham's that's how they had the heritage of the truth so they established ecclesias in foreign lands hasn't that happened? well of course it has yes verse 5 Abraham gives all to Isaac. In other words, just like God put all authority in Christ's hands, he's got all power in heaven and in earth. Verse 11 of Genesis 25. He dwells by the well Lahai Rohai. And of course that's got to do with the allegory of Genesis 16 that we've had a look at briefly. 
And then we've got something unusual, brothers and sisters. You know, if I was writing the Bible, and I would never, of course, be given that honour, but if I was writing the Bible, it would be a different book to what we've got. My mind doesn't think this way. I, I like things in their right place. So I'm not going to put a chronology about the generations of Ishmael in the wrong place. But God does. Ishmael's got a long time to live. But in verses 11, sorry, verses 12 through to verse 18 of Genesis 25, we've got the generations of Ishmael, and we read in verse 18, And they dwelt from Havilah unto Shur that is before Egypt, as thou goest toward Assyria. And he died in the presence of all his brethren. Yeah, this is a reference back to Genesis 16, verse 12, remember? This is about Judaism. He dies in the presence of all his... That's where Judaism ends up. You get your reward now, today. Because people look at this, oh, he's a wonderful chap. You get your reward now. You don't get it later on. You die in the presence of your brethren. So why, why, why is it here? Well, it's here because of verse 11. Verse 11 says, And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt by the well Lahairoi. Well, how was that well named? It was named by Hagar in Genesis chapter 16. Yeah. When she was surprised, Oh, thou God seest me. I'm not really happy about that. But Isaac, who represents Christ, would be in the presence of his God because that's exactly where he wanted to be. So you've got the contrast made between Isaac as a type of Christ and Ishmael as a type of Judaism. All right, that's why it's there. Now, when I finish, I'm going to finish. I'm not going to get to 26. But those of you who wanted to see what's in 26, um, Tim's got the Tim's got the uh, the PowerPoint slides, so he can make them available for anyone that's interested. Let's just finish off in um, Genesis 25 with the, the parable of, of Rebekah's troubled pregnancy, shall we? Verse 20. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the, the Syrian, of paid Naram, the sister of the labour of the Syrian. You've got to ask why you're told that there's the Syrians twice, but that's another subject. Verse 21. And Isaac entreated Yahweh for his wife because she was barren, and Yahweh was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. She's the type of the bride of Christ, isn't she? Clearly. So look what happens inside the bride of Christ, brothers and sisters, when God gets involved in your life. Verse 22. And the children struggled together within her. Now, who were these children? Well, Esau, man of the flesh, red all over when born, never changed, man of the flesh. Jacob, the upright man, spirit. So God has put in the womb of the bride of Christ two things. The elder, that you receive by inheritance, by natural birth. Yeah, Esau, man of the flesh. But the younger, the one that comes afterwards, so to speak, God puts there. The spirit. So it's God who initiates the struggle in our lives, brothers and sisters. And you know, she, she like us, she wonders, she ponders this. That word struggle together in the Hebrew is very violent. It's rat sets. It means to crack in pieces. So this is not about some sort of you know, little take the tay between Esau and Jacob. This is about two babies in the womb saying, get away from me, you idiot. You punch and elbow. Get away from me. She can't sleep. She cannot sleep. So she goes to Yahweh and she says in verse 22... If it be so, why am I thus? Sometimes we ask that same question. We ask, why is life in the truth sometimes so difficult? You ever ask that question? Why do we have so many problems in our family, in the ecclesia, in the brother? Why, why is it so frustrating? Well, because there's a battle going on between flesh and spirit. That's why. It's in the individual life. It's in the community. There's a battle going on between flesh and spirit. And when's it going to end, brothers and sisters? Well, look at verse 23. She went to inquire of Yahweh, which is the best place to go. 
And Yahweh said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. There's going to come a day of birth when flesh and spirit will be separated. Yeah? But it's not now. It's the day of our change, the day of our birth as immortal beings. That's when there's a separation between flesh and spirit. Until then, there's going to be a violent struggle. So don't wonder about it. Just accept what God promises you. You know what he promises you? Look what it says in verse 23 at the end of the verse. And the one people, he means Jacob, who represents Israel, the Israel of God, the one people shall be stronger than the other people. God can win the struggle in our lives. He promises it. The one people, meaning the Israel of God, will be stronger than the other people, the people of the flesh. And then he says this, And the elder shall serve the younger. My elder was what I got at birth. Very much like Esau. But the promise is there, brothers and sisters. You commit your life to God and let him work. The day will come when everybody will see what's going on right now. The elder will serve the younger. The spirit will prevail.